Let's turn in the Bible, Matthew chapter 6, and I'm actually going to begin on verse number 14. Right prior to that, Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer. Then he puts an appendix on the Lord's Prayer, and he says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There was something in the Lord's Prayer that he wanted to make sure that we did not miss, and that's this, the necessity of forgiveness. Freely we have received, freely we are to give. My friends, forgiveness is not an option. Jesus here clearly lays out, if you will not forgive, you won't be forgiven. Now the Bible's full of it. In the book of Ephesians, When it's talking about husbands and wives, it says this, do not let the sun go down on your anger. And my friends, I want to tell you something. Let let me see married hands. If you're a married couple, raise your hand. If you go to bed angry, it is a sin. It is contrary to what the word of God declares. And in Ephesians 4, it goes on to say this, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. In the book of Colossians chapter 3, the exact same truth, in exactly the same context within families, it says bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. In the book of First Peter, in chapter 2, Jesus is our example. Is that right? And then he goes right on in to say, likewise, you wise... Likewise, you wise, follow that example of Jesus. But then in verse number seven, he goes, likewise, you husbands. And then he lays out a very important truth. And that's this, that your prayers may not be hindered. Married couples, I want to tell you something. If you're not in a right relationship with each, with each other, it is impossible to be in a right relationship with God. It doesn't work. There has to be that. Now, I am older and wiser than most of you. Well, at least the older part. But I want to tell you something that I've, I've learned. And I hope you listen to me. And I hope you believe me because I'm telling you exactly the truth. When I was young and idealistic, and Cindy and I had a great marriage, I thank the Lord for our 31 years of marriage. But I want to tell you, in my younger days, it was important for me to be right. Because I had to be right because she had to be wrong. And I wanted to prove so much that I was right that there were days that she got the silent treatment. Because I was right, you were wrong, and when you apologize, maybe we'll get along again. And you know what? I have lived my life long enough to fulfill a vow before God for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until death us do part. And I want to tell you something. I have never experienced a greater love in my life than I did during those last months and weeks. And I want to tell you something. There is a joy in my heart that I fulfilled the vow before I made to God. And I stayed with the mother of my children. And I am thankful for it. And I want to tell you something else. I love my first marriage so much, I did it again. Because I know people who say, I'd never get married again. I'll get out of this one by death. I'll never have another one, you know. But I wasn't that way. But I want to tell you something. I have learned something. Because I, there was a point in my life where I would have given anything to have those stupid days that I wasted trying to be right. And the stupid days that I wasted that I was so upset over something that doesn't, I can't even remember what it is. And I guarantee you it wasn't anything that was valuable or important in my life. So this time around, I'm doing things different from the beginning. And that's this. I write my wife love notes. I text my wife love notes. 
I phone her and I tell her love notes. I buy her flowers. I open her car door and I tell her I love her because I've learned something. That's life and that's living. And it's a wonderful blessing to be in love. As a family, there is nothing that sucks the lifeblood out of you faster than as a husband and wife, you fighting. I mean, you can deal with the world, you can deal with the problems, but when you aren't together as one, as a husband and wife, it's like, it's like the energizer bunny running out. It just sucks it out of you. And the reason is, why? What, what's the point? Jesus absolutely lays out this, you must forgive one another. Now, my friends, I do not want to minimize anyone's pain because I, I know there's real pain out there in the world. We have people in our church who were uh, abused as children. There are men and women in our church that have been raped. There are people in our church that their loved ones have been murdered. So I'm talking about real pain in people's lives. But I want to tell you something. If you don't forgive, the book of Hebrews tells us a root of bitterness grows. And I have seen terrible, pitiful things. I, I saw something not too long ago from, and they're, they're not even here anymore, but from a family where the son and the father aren't even speaking to one another. And it all began from a root of bitterness that began to grow in the family. This is what you have to understand. When you have bitterness, it's never going to hurt that person that you're bitter against. That bitterness will destroy the people you love. And do you really want to pass that on to your kids and give them that same miserable life? Jesus, in Matthew chapter 18, and you got to love this story, because in, in Matthew 18, uh, Peter comes up to Jesus, and he thinks he's being magnanimous. He says, Lord, shall I forgive my brother up to seven times? I mean, Peter was thinking, I keep up like this, I'll be Pope in no time. And, and Jesus said, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times. So in other words, more than you can keep track of. But then Jesus goes on to give a parable. And here's a story. There was a king who had a guy that owed him millions and millions of dollars. And the king was going to throw him in prison. The debtor begged for forgiveness and mercy. You know who that is, don't you? That's us. The king is Jesus. It, anybody in this sanctuary want to be accountable in heaven for their sins? Do I have any takers out there? Yeah, I didn't think that I had any takers. So we have freely received this great forgiveness. But the guy that was forgiven, he goes out and he finds one of his fellow servants he grabs him by the throat and begins to choke him. Pay me what you owe me. And the guy begged for mercy using the same, exact same words that he had done to the king. And he didn't forgive him. And he threw him in the debtor's prison. And the king found out about it. And remember something. Who's telling this story? Who's writing this story? Jesus is writing and then the master, after he had called him in Matthew 18, 32, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all of that debt because you begged me. Should you not also had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers. I want to tell you something. If you're living in bitterness and unforgiveness, it's the torturers. It's a torturer in your life. It's a torturer between you and your spouse or you and your kids and those that you love the most. It is the torturers. And the worst thing is you're infecting everyone that you love with your bitterness. And it's a terrible way to live. 
It is a torturous way to live. It's a sinful way to live. And the scripture goes on, until he should pay all that was due him. Now I want, to, I want you to listen, because Jesus now tells the meaning of the parable. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brothers his trespasses. Does it sound like to you that forgiveness is an option? Because the way I read this, it doesn't sound like an option to me. And so how are we supposed to deal with it? You see, my friends, I have people who say, well, I don't feel like forgiving. I have great news. God doesn't ask you to feel like forgiving. He says, do it. And so this is what you do. You verbalize it. You say it. You take that step by faith. Lord, I forgive. And how often do you have to do that? As often as that ugly head of bitterness rises up in you. Now, I have great news. You take this step of faith and you continue to do it. Someday you may even feel like forgiving them. But that's not the point. The point is that you do it by faith. And I'm telling you, if you don't do it, the other side of that coin is torturous disaster that you have self-inflicted on your life. And you know what's sad? Upon the lives of of your children that you love the most. So we're called to forgive. In verse 16, moreover, when you fast, I want you to notice it doesn't say if you fast. It says, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Now the Pharisees were running a three ring circus. Okay, they had three different things that they were extremely hypocrites. And again, hypocrites means wearing a mask. It means play acting. The first one was giving. The second one was praying. And the third one was fasting. And you go, really? I mean, giving, praying, and fasting, they had turned into a three-ring circus? Yes, they did. And Jesus begins to address it in the first part of Matthew 6. And you can get the uh, listen to that message online. But in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, If you do your giving to be seen by men... And this is what the Pharisees were doing. They were going up. They were very wealthy people. And as they came in, they had their whole bag of gold that they had that they were going to give. And we read it where Jesus is watching how they gave. And remember, they would pour it, you know, and as all the coins were going in the containers, making lots of noise, the whole group and multitude of people watching could, ooh, ah. The little widow, she comes up and drops less than a penny. And Jesus said, I tell you, she gave more than the rest because they all gave out of their abundance. But she gave all that she had. The next big circus was at a praying. Jews had to pray three times a day. So the Pharisees timed their prayers so that they'd be on the corner of Main Street and Broadway at prayer time. And there they'd be in their long flowing prayers, their arms reached up into heaven and their vain repetitions going over and over. And you know what Jesus said? I tell you the truth, they have their reward. Now, fasting, the Jews, the Pharisees did it twice a week. They did it on Mondays and Thursdays, which happened to coincide with market day. And what they would do, they would whiten their face, and they would not comb their hair, and they would walk into the marketplace, and they go, oh my, look at Rabbi so-and-so, he's fast. Look at him, he's pining away. Now, you have to remember something. You know how they fasted? Sun up to sundown. I'm looking over this congregation and I'm pretty sure none of you are turning white if you don't eat for a few hours, all right? It's the same thing with the Muslims. You know, in Ramadan, it's all a show. They're, they're 40 days of fasting in Ramadan. It's from sunrise to sunset. I do that often in my life because sometimes I just don't have time to eat. But let me tell you something. I get home and I can make up for it in a short order of time. And I'm going to be just fine. 
And so that's not the point of fasting. In fact, I don't have time to go into it today, but Isaiah 58 does. And I encourage you to look at the fast that God approves. And you know what it deals with? It all deals with the heart. Now the scripture goes on. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting. But your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now, there's several times where I think that we should fast. But I want to clear up something about fasting. If I fast, does that mean that God will give me what I'm asking for? That, does it mean that if I fast, God's going to love me more? I mean, you know, give Gerald some brownie points. He's fasting now. Let's, let's check into him and see, is that the purpose of fasting? Is that the purpose of praying? So why then should we fast? Because Jesus said we should fast. There are two main areas in our life where we should fast over. One is for direction. I have a suggestion to Chris and Lydia and Mike and Cheryl. You better be fasting. All right? Direction in your life. When I got ready to come here, I knew that God had already spoken to my heart. But I wanted to make sure because, again, I had escaped from California once. I had preached sermons about the sin in California and God's going to knock it off in the ocean. You know, that San Andreas Fault's going to go sometime, isn't it? And all those nuts, fruits, and flakes are going to be gone, all right? I mean, there's got to be some place for San Francisco to go. And, you know. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> and so I wanted to make sure that that God was speaking to my heart. So this time of year, it was in March, I remember, I got away to Lake Wilson for a few days to pray and fast and make sure because I went in God's direction. And when I had that assurance, on the beach of Lake Wilson, I wrote in great big letters, Yes, Lord. And then I went up on a high vantage point and I took a picture of it because I knew that there would be times where I'd go, What happened? And I look back on that picture, which is still in my office today, and go, yes, Lord. I was teasing Lydia. You know, uh, when we were in Williston last week, it was 80 degrees. Unlike Yucca Valley that had snow and wind, all right? I said, God's trying to trick you, Lydia. (laughs) It was calm, beautiful, sunny days. People were wearing flip-flops, tank tops, you know, and get back. I said... Williston, North Dakota is not the edge of the world, but you can see the edge from there. You know, that's a long ways away. So my suggestion is you better be praying and fasting and making sure for both of our couples that are praying about going forth that that's what God wants. And he will reveal that to your heart. The second area is not only for direction, but for liberation. If you have a besetting sin in your life, There is a great power in fasting about it. Because you know why? You are denying yourself. You are denying your fleshly appetites. And it's true. We have a clearer mind when we're hungry. If not, think back to Thanksgiving. After you have devoured the turkey and the dressing and the green bean salad and the four other salads and five different pieces of pie, what do you want to do? You want to go stretch out in the lazy boy and sleep through a football game, okay? Because it makes you tired. So here's the deal on fasting. All the time that it takes to buy the food, prepare the food, eat the food, and clean up the food. That you focus that on the Lord for His will in your life. And God does a mighty work in our hearts and lives. So when you fast, let it be something that's real and true out of your heart. Verse number 19. And this is where our kids started memorizing from, if you're memorizing for next week. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. There was a burglar who knew some people were gone. 
So he breaks into their house in the middle of the night. And he's got a flashlight and he's going through the house. And all of a sudden he hears a voice that says, Jesus is watching you. And he's startled because he knew nobody was there. And he's shining his flashlight around. And all of a sudden he hears it again. Jesus is watching you. And he shines his flashlight in the place where it comes from. It's a parrot in a cage. And the thief is so upset because it scared him so bad and said, what kind of stupid people would teach a parrot to say that? And about that time, he hears a growling and the parrot goes, the same kind of stupid people that name their Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> what is a safe investment? You know, the Bible makes something very clear. We brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. Is there anything that's really secure? I was at the birth of all of my children. None of them brought anything with them. And I've also been at the death of many people. I want to tell you something. You take nothing out. I appreciate your prayers for my mom. I told Marilee, I want to die just like my mom, who did it just like her parents. Everything is in order. She told me the other day on the phone, she said, the only thing I've left to do is pick out my urn. She has her service planned out. She has everything done. She's doing things. But let me tell you, because I've been through it in my own life, this is what's going to happen when you die. The precious jewelry that you have, your wedding ring, your gold jewelry, the things of value will divide, be divided up amongst your closest loved ones. They may even take one or two articles of your clothing and they're going to want some pictures. But everything else is going to be put in a garbage bag and taken to the Joshua Springs thrift store. <laughs> That's how it works. We brought nothing in, we can take nothing out. Are you really going to live your life to have these? What, what is this? You know what it says on it? There was a time where this said that it was a, a gold, or I mean a silver certificate. You know what that meant? That this was a paper version, but silver was in the vault in Fort Knox that backed up what this said. It doesn't say it's a silver certificate anymore. You know what it says? It is a Federal Reserve note. Now, our government has come up with a very ingenious system. What if we run out of these? Well, we'll just print more. That's what we'll do. Is it secure? How's Wall Street going? You going to trust in that investment? You see, my friends, Jesus here is now going to lay out the truth for us. And here's the truth. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now Jesus here is telling you the truth. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So my friends, when I was a young pastor, I hated covering scriptures like this. Never did want to talk about money. As I've grown older, I don't feel that same way because you know what? It's to your hurt if I don't teach you the truth. I don't want you to get to heaven and not have anything that you have invested in the kingdom of heaven. Because the reality is this. If I keep all my money for myself, where is my heart? Where's my heart? Because Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. And if I keep it all to myself, where's my heart? My heart is selfish, isn't it? And when I love money, I'll never have money enough. The love of money is like drinking salt water. It will never satisfy you and you will always have a thirst for more. And the Bible tells us when Paul is thanking the Philippians for the gift that was given to him, Paul said, I'm not thanking you for the gift that was given for the ministry here, but for what is put on your account. Now, Jesus was talking about when you give, you're going to get a reward for it. 
And the reality is this, that as we give to the Lord and put the Lord first in our life, is he the Lord of your life? Is he the Lord of your life? If he's the Lord of your life, then every area of your life should reflect that. Now, in the book of Malachi, and remember something, the Lord never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Lord asks a question, will a man rob God? Anybody here, anybody here like to say they want to rob God? I'm pretty sure I don't want to rob God. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what ways have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And then he challenges us. And prove me now in this as a Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out on you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. I want to tell you something. I've taught the entire Bible many times. This is the only place where I know that the Lord says, test me on this and see if it's not true. When did people start giving to the Lord? We have it in the book of Genesis, don't we? In chapter 4, Abel made a sacrifice to the Lord. And what did Abel give? Abel gave his first and his best. And I want to tell you something, unless you give the Lord what's right, if you try to wait and give the Lord what's left over, there'll never be anything left over. In Genesis 14, and this is long before the law, Abraham tied to the Lord. Now, I want to give you a national statistic. This is from born-again evangelical Bible-believing Christians, all right? I'm not talking about, you know, the brand-name denomination Christian that, you know, was born in that church and going to die in that church. I'm talking about people who say that they are true believers and filled with the Spirit of God. The average of what believers give is 2.5%. I was one of those. When I was... Growing up, I was wealthy. We were taking over a multi-million dollar farm. When we got married, I was wealthy. I, brought, I bought a new car. And it, all the way through high school, I had three to $4,000 in my checking account. And in those days, three to $4,000 bought you a brand new car. I bought a, a 1970 Ford Maverick baby blue hood scoop tires and... It had an eight-track tape player. That's how cool it was. It was a hot car, let me tell you. And that hot car, I'd fill up at my dad's gas pumps. We had 500-gallon tanks of, of fuel on the farm, you know. And if I did go to town to buy, to get gas, well, we lived in small towns. I'd pull up, they'd come out, fill up your car with gas, and I'd say, charge it. And so I had all kinds of money. And I was generous to our church. And I'd write healthy checks, but I want to tell you something. I wasn't tithing. And when I left the farm and my dad disowned me, I was a slave in Bible college down at Sky Valley Desert Retreat. We got five bucks a week. That was to buy deodorant and toothpaste so we didn't stink, in case you're wondering what that five bucks was for. Lord taps me on the shoulder and said, let's try this tithing thing again. You know what? If you only got five bucks, it doesn't matter whether you give 50 cents to the Lord. When I got a raise and got 10 bucks, didn't matter whether I had 10 or nine. When I had 100 bucks, didn't matter whether I had 90 or 100. Now that I have 10 million, no, 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 no. <laughs> but the point is this. It's a sliding scale. And when you give the Lord the first, he always blesses you. Now, the Lord doesn't want a grudging obligation. You don't have to get out your calculator and go, okay, I got to give the Lord that much. Keep it if that's your heart. But my friends, you will pay the price because there is coming an eternal reward and you're going to be sorry that you didn't spend more time investing in the kingdom of heaven because when you give here, you know what that means? 
I'll tell you something that just happened this last week. You're a part of this ministry here. There is now a little boy in Africa who's going to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He was born in prison and he is going to be in heaven because you gave. You give, there's kids that come to our school. I want to tell you a little something about Joshua Springs Christian School. Not everybody that comes is Christians. Parents lie on the applications. (laughs) And so non-Christian kids are here. But you know what ends up happening? They get saved. And many times their family gets saved. And you know what? You get credit for it. That person in Afghanistan that asked Jesus into their heart, you get credit for it. The churches that we've started already around the world, the work that's going on in Peru, the work that's going on in Russia. Mike and Cheryl go to southern Idaho and that church starts, guess what? We all get to be a part of it. Chris and Lydia, if they end up going to Williston, and here's what's going to happen out of all of these ministries that we help be a part of. And the young people that we raise up for that next generation, they're going to start and then other fellowships are going to start out of them. Is that not an exciting, wonderful thing and that's bringing the all the gifts to the storehouse because together we can do what none of us could do by ourselves and it's a blessing of God eternally for us now the scripture goes on if the lamp of the body or the lamp of the body is the eye if therefore your eye is good your whole body will be full of light but if your eye is bad your whole body will be full of darkness if therefore the light that is in you in darkness how great is that darkness the view that you have depends on the kind of eye that you have now the bible tells us this in more than one occasion but in psalm 18 verse 25 With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. But listen, with the devious, you show yourself shrewd. You see, my friends, your view of the world, your view of other people, your view of God, it's coming through the filter of your eye. This is why, and it is classic, and you see it in human nature over and over. You see it in addictive personalities. Addictive personalities do what? They're blaming everybody else. And their eye is watching the faults of everybody else. Because if they're doing that, they don't have to deal with themselves. Now I want to ask you a question. Who does God want to deal with? Who's God want to deal with? Trust me, you are a full-time project. (laughs) And you have plenty of wickedness in your own heart to have to be dealt with. So it is your eye, and that's why, really, the eyes are the window to the soul. Have you ever looked at somebody who won't look you in the eye? I don't trust people who don't look me in the eye. It was when my kids were growing up and they would get in trouble, the greatest punishment that they had was when I was disciplining them, they'd have to look me in the eye. You know how that went, right? (laughs) The eyes are a window of the soul. If your eye is bad, your whole body is bad. Now, I want to tell you something, just a little sidelight that I found interesting. In the Middle East, in all of the Muslim countries, they have a thing called the evil eye. And this evil eye, it's blue, it kind of goes in a circle, and, and it's, it's, it's like witchcraft type stuff. And it's the evil eye watching you, but the Jews have something else. And again, it's nothing biblical. Have you ever seen the Jewish symbol that is the open hand there? That is to stop the evil eye. So the Muslims have their evil eye and the Jews have their hand to stop the evil eye. Nothing's biblical, but I just thought that was interesting. Now in verse 24, we come back to money. One out of every six verses in Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about money. 16 of the 29 parables talk about money. Why is that? How much time do you spend on money? 
making money, earning money, spending money, paying bills. I don't know about you, but I spend a good portion of my life doing that kind of stuff. That's why Jesus is talking about it. He says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, the Bible says this, for we brought nothing into this world and is certain we'll carry nothing out. Having food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Listen, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from their faith in the greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The people in Williston are, are great, good people farm people, just classic Midwest people, but they have now been inundated with all these people coming in. And a lot of those people, you know why people are flocking there? A truck driver makes 50 bucks an hour, okay? Anyone that wants to work can make big money. Walmart pays 17 bucks an hour and can't find anybody to work. The reason being, I'm not working at Walmart for 17 when I can drive a truck for 50, I met a young guy on the plane. He has the right degree. He's making $20,000 a month. In case you can't figure that out, that's a quarter of a million dollars a year. 5000 bucks a week. And there is work absolutely everywhere. So you have all these men who have left their families, many of them, and single guys out there. And you know what tons of single guys also brings? People who are willing to sell themselves and pierce their own souls. Is it a sin to be rich? Let's get that out of the way. Is it a sin to be rich? Does the Bible ever say it's a sin to be rich? Do you realize that it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, His generosity? And I know people that are very generous and God just blesses. And the more they give, the more that God gives them. And it's a beautiful picture. But in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 17, it goes on to say, Command those who are rich. I find that interesting. It doesn't say suggest to those who are rich that they should give. It says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. And let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give and willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come again that they may lay hold of eternal life. Isn't it amazing? I want to tell you something. You love money, it will take you to hell. That's what the scriptures teach. You can use your money as a great tool, and everyone, regardless of their income, can invest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 25, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Well, we don't need to cover this portion of scripture. We don't have anybody that worries here, do we? Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The birds in the air, for they look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, for your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than they? And which of you by worrying can add one cubit of stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not clothe you, O you of little faith? You know, it's interesting here because as we look at this, what do we see? It's a sin to worry. When we worry, we're like the heathens who don't even realize they have a heavenly father that loves them. Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like like what God does, the grass of the field. Isn't clothing funny? You know, clothing comes and goes. You know, in the 1970s, 
height of fashion, plaid bell-bottom pants. It got worse in the 1980s. Do you remember the short, tight shorts and the knee socks up to your knees with like colored bands around them? Or how about this one? Do you remember the days where the baggy, wild, elastic pants and the fanny packs? Now, I got to tell you, I can't wait for this generation to have kids. Those kids seeing their dads with their pants below their underwear, they ain't going to be able to pick themselves up off the ground laughing at them. (laughs) Serves them right. (laughs) I'd like to read something to you off my iPhone here because it's really true. When I was in my 20s, I stood in a hospital corridor waiting for the doctors to put a few stitches in my son's head. I asked, when do you stop worrying? The nurse said, when they get out of the accident stage. My mother just smiled faintly and said nothing. When I was in my 30s, I sat in a little chair in a classroom and heard how one of my children talked incessantly, disrupt the class, and was headed for a career making license plates. And as if to read my mind, the teacher said, don't worry, they all go through this stage and then you can sit back, relax, and enjoy them. My mother didn't say anything. She just smiled faintly and said nothing. When I was in my 40s, I spent a lifetime of waiting for the phone to ring, the cars to come home, the front door to open, and a friend said, they're just trying to find themselves. Don't worry, in a few years you can stop worrying and they'll be adults. My mother just smiled faintly and said nothing. By the time I was 50, I was sick and tired of being vulnerable. I was still worried over my children. But there was a new wrinkle. There wasn't anything I could do about it. My mother just smiled faintly and said nothing. And I continued to anguish over their failures and be tormented by their frustrations and absorbed by their disappointments. My friend said that when my kids got married, I could stop worrying and lead my own life. I wanted to believe that, but I was haunted by my mother's warm smile and her occasional, you look pale, are you all right? Call me the minute you get home. Are you depressed about something? Can it be that parents are sentenced to a lifetime of worry? Is concern for one another handed down like a torch to blaze a trail of human frailties and the fears of the unknown? Is it a concern, a, a, is it a concern or a cause or a virtue that elevates us to the highest form of life? One of my children became quite irritable, irritable recently, saying to me, Where were you? I've been calling you for three days and no one answered. I was worried about you. I smiled a warm smile and said, the torch has been passed. (laughs) You need to think about that before you have your first baby. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. And here's the key, my friends. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own thing. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day. What? Our daily bread. Today is the tomorrow I worried about yesterday. Let's stand.